Hi, I'm Brennan. I'm in Gary Bader's lab. I'm actually about to pass my walls, so I guess that puts me at a year and a half in his lab. Um, and I've been lucky enough to work with uh, Michael Borat and Scott Yuzwa over at um, SickKids on their uh, great data set of um, single cell RNA seq data from the mouse embryonic uh, cerebral cortex. Um, I'm not going to talk to you guys about brain development today. I just want to give a little talk on um, what high throughput single cell RNA seq is and what it can do for you, mainly in the context of identifying cell types from it, using it sort of as a molecular microscope to take a whole tissue <coughs> and find all the cell types in the tissue. Um, so, high throughput single cell RNA seq, as opposed to uh, some of the other single cell technologies out there, is specifically droplet based and can collect hundreds to thousands of single cell transcript films in one experiment. Um, the way they do that is by mixing uh, your, your suspension of cells with um, beads containing primers uh, and oil in a microfluidics device uh, such that you get one bead and one cell in one droplet, hopefully. Um, the, the beads are suspended to lysis buffer, so upon encapsulation, the cell lyses. Um, the uh, beads contain um, poly T oligos that pick up the mRNA. And then you can do um, reverse transcriptase either in the droplet in some contexts or after cooling all the droplets in other contexts. And then, um, sorry, I should probably have slugs, cell lysis, you hybridize the RNA, which probably can tell, I said that already. Um, and then, yeah, reverse transcriptase either happens cooled af after you cool all the droplets or in the droplets themselves, depending on the technology. And the, the key point here is that the um, Primers actually contain uh, two, bar well, three, yeah, two barcodes. Um, one barcode is specific to that bead, so all the um, mRNA, all the cDNAs that you generate from the reverse transcriptase step will have the same barcode if they came from the same droplet and theoretically therefore from the same cell. And the other barcode is unique to that primer. Uh, which reduces, well, it eliminates the um, PCR amplification bias because now you have a unique uh, barcode for each cDNA molecule prior to your PCR amplification step, so you can collapse all your reads down into a single trigger. Um, so then you can do your alignment um, and deconvolute your, uh, all your reads, or all your transcripts rather, back to each individual cell, and that gives you a uh, a cell by gene matrix of Kent. So then um, we do the after uh, after sequencing um, data analysis, which is sort of where where I came into the project. Um, so you need to do some quality control for cells that are damaged or maybe got multiple cells in the droplet. You need to do a little bit of filtering for genes as well for non-meaningful and noisy genes. Um, and a normalization because each cell was captured in a separate droplet, so each cell has some um, technical variation uh, re related to the uh, efficiency of the mRNA capture or maybe the reverse transcriptase if that happened in the droplet. Um, and then ultimately the goal would be, well, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the identification of cell types from this, this heterogeneous pool of cells that you put in um, with the idea that cell type or cell, cells from the same cell type should have similar transcriptomes and therefore clustering uh, to maximize the similarity between transcriptomes will identify cell types. Um, when we started and the field in terms of analysis is rapidly changing, but when we started there were only two main pipelines for doing this, and unfortunately there's no gold standard data set for cell types and RNA-seq data, so there's n there was no real empirical assessment of what was the best way of doing it. So what I ended up doing was uh, sort of Frankensteining these two um, pipelines for analysis together based on what we felt was best practices. Um, and our assessment method was to actually look at our data and in conjunction with the biologists who, who 
knew what they were expecting to see in the neurodevelopmental sphere, um, to see what actually gave us data that seemed to make the most sense. Uh, so unfortunately, not the most empirical way of going about assessing the quality of these things. And uh, the Human Cell Atlas, which is a group that is working on this single cell thing, is hopefully developing a gold standard data set. So we'll be able to start testing these things. But for now, this is the idea. Um, so two cell type, uh, two types of cells that we want to filter out. Um, one are cells that are damaged or dying, um, and therefore probably not meaningful to us. Um, generally, they will have smaller library sizes. So if we look at library size, which is the number of transcripts we detected, not reads, but collapsed down into their unique UMIs um, per cell, and then we look at the number of genes we detected as sort of a metric of the complexity of each library. Um, so cells with small library sizes and small complexity are maybe meaningless, so we can filter them out. Um, and on the other end, cells that are unexpectedly large, um, maybe doublets. There is a pretty consistent doublet rate based on the number, of, the concentration of cells you put into these machines. It's been experimentally determined by mixed populations of human and mouse cells. Um, so you can tune your, your doublet filter based on the expected doublet rate. Oh, okay, uh, I'll hurry up. Um, no, intra, or point to note is that um, these high throughput methods are considerably less sensitive than plate-based methods. So um, that's something to be aware of. Um, the other metric for filtering out damaged cells is um, the proportion of uh, transcripts that are sourced from the mitochondrial genome. Um, because those transcripts never leave the mitochondria, in the case of the leaky cytosol, they won't necessarily leak at the same rate that the rest of the transcripts do. Um, and uh, in very damaged cells, you'll see uh, mitochondrial transcript percent increase relative to the rest of the transcript. Um, that also nicely correlates with, with smaller library sizes to give us a bit of confidence that we're not just filtering in cells that are uh, very, have high energetic requirements. Um, I'm going to skip that part, but uh, so, actually no, uh, cell free mRNA, since the cytosols of some of these damaged cells are leaking, you may pick up cell free RNA, um, and hopefully it's not a problem because it should be consistent across all cells, but we are looking into ways of addressing that. Anyway, um, the other thing you can do is cell cycle annotation. I only include this because we happen to have four time points over the course of um, neurogenesis, and the number of postmitotic cells as neurogenesis proceeded should increase, and we can actually see the proportion of cells in G1 increase over time, so we were excited to see that. Um, uh, we filter out uninformative genes, and we do this on a very, very, very uh, not conservative uh, way. Um, it turns out that if we leave in genes that have one or two, um, they're only detected in one or two cells. It really screws up the normalization, so we removed those, but that was it because we wanted to maintain the amount of data, as much data as we could. Um, the normalization, uh, we used a method by uh, John Marioni's group that um, pools, that tries to address the sparsity issue in this data. There's the, because of the low sensitivity, um, there's a lot of zeros in the data. Um, their solution to this, for normalization is to um, pool subsets of cells and normalize those pooled subsets um, to, a to define size, a scaling factor for each um, supercell that you pool, and then iteratively do that until you have scaling factors for each individual cell based on you, uh, solving all those sets of pools. Um, it might be an over-engineered solution to this problem, but it works a lot better than other methods, so. That's handy. Then clustering. Um, the number of clustering methods for single cell has exploded recently, but again, only recently have people started actually testing the differences between them. Um, and we selected this one prior to that, and it seems to be consistently perform well as people have tested their fancy new methods. So we're sticking with it for now. The idea behind it is you reduce the number of dimensions in gene space using principal component analysis, and then build a k nearest neighbors graph um, of Euclidean distances between cells. 
So each cell is a node in that graph. Um, and then use uh, graph theory based uh, modularity um, maximizing methods to cluster the graph. Um, and it seems to work. Uh, TSNI is used just for visualization because uh, even after a principal component analysis, you still have many dimensions of data. So spectral TSNI is used, and we can see that we actually find all our expected uh, cell types, which is awesome. Um, the other thing I'd like to quickly highlight in single cell data is this idea of pseudo time analysis, where you, in developmental um, work, you, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about that. It's an empty, and uh, <laughs> uh, you can just believe me that these precursors make these intermediate generators, which make these two projection neuron populations. And in fact, this population arises prior to this one. So you can draw the pseudo time, and there's minimum advantage for you to do that, but you can see it there nicely in t which is kind of. Um, I built a interactive our shiny tool to explore the data, um, but yeah, you can talk to me about that. Um, and that is all. I would like to thank uh, my committee, um, Princess Margaret Genomics, and I would like to encourage anyone who's doing single cell RNA-seq, um, especially analysis of single cell RNA-seq, to get in touch with me about this group of people who get together bi-weekly to complain about single cell RNA-seq analysis and solve our problems. Thank <laughs> you.